different sensors, different cameras, microphones, geometry, evidence from seven miles up, evidence from down on the surface, all this variety of independent evidence converging on something that JPL and NASA seem loath to think about, to talk about, to comment on, to react to at all. So what we have to do as an independent investigation is do the kind of archaeological forensics that NASA should be doing. In fact, as you're going to hear in the next hour, I think we can prove that NASA is doing on Mars right now, tonight, even as you're listening. You're on the other side of midnight. My name is Richard C. Hoagland. We shall. And welcome back, everyone, to the other side of midnight, which is now the other side of the day because the witching hour has turned here in the land of enchantment. It is now early, early, early Sunday morning. And we're having this wide-ranging discussion. Is it possible that there was this extraordinary succession of incredibly sophisticated, high-tech civilizations on the planet Mars? And the last one to have left built the Yezero Dome as the last place on Mars where one could live in a contained, protected environment. There's all kinds of stuff on the maps on the surface. There are pyramids. As I said last week, there's one collection that looks eerily like Giza with two big ones and then a smaller one offset at the same angle as the belt stars of Orion. And they brought these migrants, these refugees. Interesting how migrants and refugees are in the news right now in a very big way. Well, in the larger sense, is a major portion of the human race really refugees from this other world that in a Lowellian sense was getting worse and worse and worse around them until even there, extraordinary technology could not sustain life and so they again our great 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 ancestors had to come to the only place else in the solar system where they could live without a dome namely here is this what we're seeing in these incredibly obviously objectively definable and verifiable geometric structures of glass extending miles above the surface of Yezero Crater. Okay, before we get to the next couple of images, anybody want to say anything they haven't had time to say? Uh, yeah, 
Richard Ruggiero here. Hi there. Hi there. So I just wanted to um, highlight your uh, the comparisons of a, a glass with the uh, shattering poss possibly coming through from the domes from above and the, the refraction onto the floor. Mm -hmm. And I put into the Fred link a um, image of a diver in the cenotes of Mexico, which I'd mentioned previously. And I feel that it will, would highlight to the viewer if they haven't dived underwater uh, just how you get that refraction and scattering effect of light um, that looks identical to what you have described um, on your imagery. I think that was a really important point to push. Mm, super. Anybody else? Uh, I'd like to throw one more in the uh, one more picture in the mix uh, out of sequence because it kind of fits. If people will look at number two, which is easy in my se uh, section, uh, the because uh, there there's an extremely overworked version of uh, part of a frame. I've got the entire frame, the original naked untouched uh, frame. I just put the image number on it down down below it, but above it is a very highly worked one to show the um, structure that we can see up above. You know, so wait, wait, wait. You're thinking thing. you're you're thinking that those vertical and horizontal lines are part of the dome? Uh, no, not necessarily. Uh, no, I just said they prove that this is a picture not distorted by the camera. See, oh, uh, so you're looking at the straight line geometry of the bay of the bare filter on the CCDs to show that we're not seeing distortion. Right, but the curve in the upper left, which is one of those rainbows against the dome, you'll notice the way that it's kind of sheared by those. Well, that means that it's something external to the camera that ah, was suffering okay. the effects of the of that. Uh, a Bayer filter is a sort of an averaging filter in the little tiny boxes that are part of the CCD because there's a multiple of different single color LEDs there. And in order to ultimately get a color mix, uh, it, at that, cause it shouldn't show at this scale. I mean, this is not enlarged that much. I mean, the, you know, the full frames right, right below it. But in any case, it's, yeah, that, that's providing a little distortion. And what it's doing is chopping up that, that arch, which would, is not something you would see if you were standing there, you would see it smooth. So that means that it's outside of the camera in case anybody thinks that it's all a camera artifact. But also because of uh, all that contest work, you'll notice down below there's a bunch of buildings back there over that ridge that we're so familiar with. It's got, um, you know, this is not too far from where the, that, uh, the originally called bunker, now called Kodiak. Kodiak, uh, Kodiak Temple. Temple. Yeah. yeah, so the Kodiak Temple bunker, the KTB. <laughs> Is, uh, <laughs> which is under the control of the KGB, who left Russia when they got very franchised. Uh, yes. Anyway, the um, in any case, yeah, there's buildings back there, folks. There were lots of people living here. And okay, that's let also me... a chance to see what one of the naked images looks like. I just wanted to throw that in the mix. Okay, go back to what you were saying. Okay. Well, I want to do a segue now because one of the amazing things, and we got about an hour to talk about this that NASA is proposing to do in a couple weeks is to fly a helicopter on Mars. Now, to understand the engineering feat they're claiming they're gonna pull off, since 1965, when the first NASA spacecraft, Mariner 4, flew by Mars 6,000 miles away, and then kind of flew behind the planet as seen from Earth, so they could measure the attenuation of the radio signal sending back the telemetry information and thereby judge properties of the Martian atmosphere in situ for the first time. That's when the principal investigator, who I actually was able to have lunch with at JPL, oh, that I knew now, or I knew then what I know now. Oh, that conversation would have been so different. Anyway, he was a nice guy. He was the chief scientist on this and he was very proud <clears throat> that they measured the atmosphere and according to his readings um, unlike the Lowell era which had an atmosphere on Mars about 10 percent the density of what you guys at sea level are out there breathing tonight so it's equivalent to being well up in the Andes or you know climbing Mount Everest or whatever 
um, one tenth atmosphere. He measured the atmospheric pressure and density as one one hundredth, one percent, which meant all life, all existence without technology, without breathing apparatus, without the ability to generate, you know, pressurized oxygen, all that went out the window. And the whole Lowell model of an ancient struggling civilization on Mars, building canals to, you know, channel water from the poles to the equator, that whole wonderful fantasy of Edgar Rice Burroughs was thrown into the ash can of history. So from 1965 on, the canonical model of Mars is that it is super cold during the night and not very warm during the daytime. Uh, the air temperature is utterly, bitterly cold all the time because the density is so low. It's equivalent, and this is crucial to remember, it's equivalent to the Earth's atmosphere above 100,000 feet. The Martian surface density and pressure, according to all of science now, NASA, the Russians, the Chinese, the Japanese, all spacefaring agencies, all astronomers agree the Martian atmosphere, starting with the readings from Mariner 4 in 65, is less than 1% of Earth's equivalent of that sea level, and namely what you'd find at 100,000 feet over the Earth here. So, go to number 16. This is a side-by-side -side comparison of a photograph on the left taken from a U-2 at 70,000 feet above the Earth. And the view on the right is another Percy image in late afternoon on the surface at sea level looking toward the western crater rim with the sun at the very top descending, uh, I think it's about 3, 3.30 in the afternoon local Martian time. Does the atmosphere on Mars on the right look anything like the atmosphere at 100,000 feet above Earth on the left? And the answer is no. This is a stark photographic comparison telling me, I'm not going to ask anybody else to agree with me to the extreme I'm going to go, but it tells me that NASA has been systematically lying about an entire planetary atmosphere for over 50 years, over half a century, beginning with Calori's experiment, they have been lying. Why? Well, I don't know. I have suspicions. I think it has to do with who came here, who thinks their royal line of succession extends back to Mars, who owns Mars, who does not own Mars, who's in the in crowd, who's in the out crowd, in other words, I think it's all about elites, it's all about ownership, it's all about the migration, the refugees who came here, who have been lying through their teeth like crazy to keep their origins on Mars in their genetic bloodline lineage going back thousands of years, 40,000 years, if we can believe the sudden emergence of those brilliant cave paintings at the Sioux and the ones that I uh, talked about off Marseille underwater last week. I think they've been hiding the real Mars, also making the color of the sky blood red so no one will want to live there, because they want it all to themselves. NASA exists not to provide data to the rest of us, it exists to provide data to those who feel they are the royalty, the lineage that came from Mars with the right to rule the Earth. Kind of echoing what uh, Joseph Farrell was saying couple of hours ago. Anyway, they're going to fly into this environment a helicopter called Ingenuity. That's number 17. Well, ostensibly, this helicopter to fly in this incredibly rarefied atmosphere, which is, again, 1% of what you're breathing right now, has to have rotors that are four feet across that spin at 3,000 RPM, and yet they're worried about wind gusts which can damage the attitude stabilization of their rover, which has to run autonomously. You can't run it from Earth because of the speed of light time lag between seven and 12 minutes. So it's all being done by computer. It's all being programmed. They're gonna have five flights over 30 days. The first 30 days of beginning April 8th, they're gonna devote 
solely to flying this little helicopter. And uh, I have some things to say about that that I'll say later in the show. But frankly, it boggles the mind that someone would put together this kind of experiment, the density of air notwithstanding. Now I want you to look at number six, uh, number 18, okay? This is an image I sent to Kathea at the last minute because what you see there, oriented sort of the down is down and up is up, and the curving has can be able to view, is this incredible rainbow in the glass. Ron and I have gone back and forth for the last, you know, six, seven days with all the things this could be caused by, like reflections internal between the lens elements, the curvature being caused by the wide angle distortion, and we systematically eliminated with other imagery one explanation after the other. Ultimately, Andrew, I think we're seeing this incredible rainbow on Mars because of the remaining density of the glass to the north of the landing site, which is dense enough to show us the prismatic refraction in the multi-layered, incredibly complex geometric you know, composition of this dome. And we're seeing it right there in this extraordinary view of the landscape. And let me throw you know, out another option. Okay, Leslie? Um, could that be akin <laughs> to a sun dog that we see here on Earth on occasion? Well, we see... No. Go, go ahead, Ron. I'll, I'll say no because it, you need moisture. Ah, the air is, is, the air is, is there incredibly moisture there? dry. None. Well, so reported. <laughs> Well, see, well, this, fair enough. This, fair enough, but I no, no, but I understand what you're saying. No, if, I just thought I'd if, throw that out there as another no, brainstorm good, idea. Good call. I think you'd call it a skybo. By the way, I think there actually is a term for something you know, like the, that. The, the, the problem, enough. Leslie, is it's persistent. This is not just the only image. We've got mm -hmm. image after image after image, and it stays geometrically just right. about where it is, meaning it's got to be anchored in the glass of the dome. Once you establish that's what I was here. trying to set up right. with that pit, with that picture of mine, so that people had that in mind. It's yeah, it's got to be something to do with the dome. It's not something right. from the camera. And that now, leaves out an atmospheric effect. As now well. again, <clears throat> hint, hint. Probably, I'm not saying you could do it. Maybe it's dust, but I don't think I don't. What I would like I to do is to set up an experiment where we have a dome, we have like a webcam, we have a light source like a projector to simulate the sun, we look at the right geometry at the dome with the sun simulated coming through. And we see if the curving geometry creates this rainbow effect all by the geometry. Is anybody out there willing to undertake <clears throat> this experiment? Hint, hint. <laughs> Somebody, well, all the, co all the colleges are, most of the colleges are closed. You kind of need a college lab. Well, I'm they... thinking of someone slightly closer to home, closer to the other side of Italy. An engineer, huh. perhaps. Um, anyway, I'm just going to kind of let that yeah. hang out there. I have a th one more thought to add. Sorry to keep jumping in like this, but looking at that, I mean, no matter how you tilt the pit, even if you tilt the picture back to its, you know, its configuration as a, as a photo. Uh, look at the amount of curvature in that, um, those bands there, the rainbow, the sky bow. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not dense enough. Not, uh, it's, see, they follow the, the rainbows follow a catenary curve. You know, as, as some very uh, clever fellow in the mid 17th century succinctly put when they were trying to engineer Gothic cathedrals said if you uh, if you take a slack rope and you hang it between two posts and then you uh, look at that curve you flip that you invert that and you've got your load bearing curve for the um, uh, buildings well he turned out to be right about that but it's a, that's it's not that kind of a curve it's the kind of reflection that you would get on like a windshield you mean refraction Refraction, yeah, it's the kind of refraction we, you know, look at it. It's practically not quite, but practically a straight line. Yeah, it's too straight. And they, it's almost too straight, elegantly straight. Mm -hmm. Now we have yeah, another photograph that, again, because I didn't want to overload for Kathy because she has to do all this, kind of like in the dark, blindfolded, with her 
typing behind her. Um, we have a photo- wearing oven mitts. Yes. Uh, well, exactly. We, we have another photograph which shows the internal light scattering caused by sunlight in the camera lens, and that scattering is perfectly straight. Same lens, same camera, but the but it shows in the background, a bit muted because there's dust in the atmosphere on on that shot. It shows the same curve, but in the other side, the opposite you know, uh, geometry. In other words, it curves from from up, bottom, up toward the left as opposed to top, down toward the right. So it's like a mirror image. But on the same image, you can see the internal reflections in the lens because you're looking right at the sun and they don't bear any geometric resemblance to this exquisite Martian rainbow. Everybody's speechless. Yeah, R Richard, we're talking the same image, right? Number yeah, 18? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know what this brings to mind is uh, Ron and I have been talking about this, and I think we might have all, we might even have spoken about this on air. But it's the idea that when these domes were on, I think, Ron, you were saying it may have not been that necessary or, you know, aesthetically for the Martians to see the sky. But when I'm looking at this, and I, and I realize, you know, most of it's shattered and they're, you know, arcing sort of eggshell bits of shards. And when I say eggshell, I mean, comparatively speaking, these are, you know, miles up. Um, but there's a there's a, a clarity and elegance here. I think they did want to see the sky. Of course they did. Uh, yeah. Of course they did. They, these were transparent domes, and they even they have complex geometry. See, I'm thinking of, of Burroughs, you know, John Carter mm -hmm. of Mars, Princess of Mars. You know, his classic phrase was the crystal cities of Barsoom. We're looking at the shattered crystal cities in Yezero Crater, overlain by a crystalline dome. Uh, you want to go to your sketches, Andrew, because they're really sure. elegant. They're very evocative. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, so my items, and Ron, I didn't mean that as a, as a, as a shot. It's just that you, we're throwing no, ideas no. around constantly, and many different things could be going on here yeah so under my items um where am i okay I'm, i like uh, to be wrong it means i learned something no 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 i just remember you saying yeah. that you, that the martians may have not you know val needed it or valued it right. and i'm looking at this going i don't know but i'm anyhow. a grumpy recluse get off my lawn <laughs> yeah i don't you know it's, i don't i i don't <laughs> i uh, my my aesthetics are not always the same as everybody else's yeah you know. well anyways my um <laughs> My item is called, uh, eight, uh, oh, I know, we're eight minutes close to the break, so I'll keep it short, Keith, thank you. Um, AC, Crystal Cities of Mars. Now, I, I did this, the top image, I was just sketching up something for the show to, you know, we're, Ron and I have been going back and forth, and Richard's sort of saying, what can you do in here? And I, I'm trying to get a bigger picture of what this whole thing might have looked like. And, you know, I mean, there's amazing images on the internet you can find of all these, these crystals. stunning, as always, Andrew. Oh, thank you. So the first one at the top was one I did last week, and I was um, really trying to think about the base of this thing, um, you know, how, how this thing was built, and and I was looking, thinking of really steep sort of gothic-like um, openings all the way around it. And my next image was something that Ron and I were literally spitballing as I was driving. He was, you know, yelling at me through the phone, and I'm like, you know, <laughs> when I got home, I'm sketching bread bowl. it up. It looks like a bread bowl. Yeah, that's what yeah, I'm saying. Uh, you want to explain this, Ron? Because you're going to do it better than, than I. Please. Uh, I was I was trying to get the oblate shape that I was thinking of. Uh, no, wait, you, Ron, across, you, have, you have to start yeah. with what you started with, which was the geometry you can see in the uplook images from the falling spacecraft on the parachute, looking at all that glass, all that geometry, and the weird curves from which you were right. deriving the bigger geometry of the whole damn dome. Which is well. I'll try one of my famous analogies that nobody ever gets. Think of the bandages on the Invisible Man or the Mummy or something. Oh, okay. Okay, I see strips, strips. You know, ragged strips. And uh, I think that in its certainly in its current incarnation, I think they uh, one of the possible techniques would be to weave it like a basket. And so I was going. I was saying I was sending Richard and Andrew both pictures of pictures of uh, what they call belly baskets, the ones that bulge in the middle like a, either you put your laundry in it or somebody blows on their um, flute and a snake rises out of the top, you know, those things. Hmm. Uh, 
and or a bread bowl. You know, like you go to your favorite restaurant, you get a tasty bowl of your favorite soup inside of a sourdough boulette that's been hollowed out like a pumpkin. And uh, that was it was all because of the idea that there had to be a hole or a hub at the top. It's now a hole. Maybe it was not. Maybe it was a hub originally. Uh, but um, so that's what this came out of. And so Andrew gave me a couple that are. Um, as you can see, they even tuck in at the bottom. And I thought, you know, actually, that's not necessarily a bad model because one of the problems you have with a dome is when you get close to the edge, you kind of run out of usable space. So you have to do something with that. You know, there's no headroom to speak of. Yeah, and but wait, wait, wait. wait. With, have... a, with, a, with a dome that's 30 miles across and 7 miles high, who cares? The edge is still going to come down at such a shallow angle that you certainly, you know, as, as a six-foot person could stand right at the edge. And we don't know oh, the yeah, geometry at the, at the base because, remember, if, if, no. if, if this is what I'm thinking in terms of Leslie, Engineer Leslie, um, the, the forces distributed in an arch, most of the forces are going to be concentrated as they should at the base. That's why you build in a crater. So the huge mass of the crater wall provides a solid bedrock support for the lateral forces. And that's why I think we're still seeing vestiges of this stuff sticking up along the crater rim because the biggest amount of mass, the most glass would have been at the surface, at the base, at the rim, and enough of it sticking up to cause that incredibly bright prismatic uh, uh, projection on the ground next to the rover that Ron incredibly found. Well, I think I found the base of one of the domes, by the way. This is not in Javero, but it's uh, – if you look at number six of mine, at the, that's a uh, – which I had up before. We didn't get to discuss it, and we weren't talking about domes yet. But it, you'll, you'll see from the top edge down toward the left, there's a um, gentle – Oh, yes, 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 yes. Oh, that looks like an and edge I of a think, dome. Yeah, I Holy think that's the cow. base of a dome. Do we know and where the context this... shot right underneath it, which you can spend an hour or two trying to find that spot on there, but you will. Oh, thanks, um, thanks. Do we know where yes, this is? No, it... uh, uh, let me think. Uh, no, I can't remember. I never. Um, it's. Yeah, that looks that. like a top-down view. We see the same thing at Yezero. Remember. Yeah, that's the. Yeah, that's the whole number. You can just. If anybody wants to hunt for these, by the way, quick searching tip, if you're looking for an MRO one, you can just go to Google, but just stop where the numbers stop. In other words, in this case, you type in ESP underscore 066622 underscore 2000. Just skip the stuff about, you know, the, about the filters. Just skip the RGB stuff, because that will screw up the search. But you can find the image page. And on their image page, they happen to comment on the fact that there's a strange curve, strangely even-looking curve. It's in the little, you know, the paragraph that opens up an image page. Really? They, yeah, they, yeah they, they actually mention it. There. Yeah, they explain it. How do they explain it as geological or of course. It's minerals or something? Of but, course. Oh, and, Richard, any, anything but what it is. Richard, I know we're yeah. getting close to the break, but I want to add one thing, Ron. I don't mean to step on you when oh, you come please. back. No, no, no. I was stepping on you, Andrew. Get no, back no, in there. No, no. After you, okay. Alphonse. So, after you, Alphonse. <laughs> well, one of the things I did, Richard, based on something uh, Ron said, is uh, we talked about um, soap bubbles and the way soap bubbles will sort of, con you know, kind of collect together and, and, and support each other in, you know, in very effective ways. That's why I put the, again, mm -hmm. referring back to my image, that's why in my dome, I was experimenting with this idea of having, you know, smaller domes or semi-domes surrounding the larger dome. Again, we're just spitballing, and I'd love to, after the break, address my last image which is from John Carter of Mars actually from a Dell comet from 1953 and I know we're 90 seconds out okay we can do that we can even walk and chew gum cool and when we get back I'm gonna give you my take on what the real hidden mission of perseverance really is so you're not gonna want to miss that you are on the other side of midnight. My guests, the Enterprise Mission Imaging Team, with noted guests, or in this case, a noted princess, 
an engineer who happens to dabble in glass. What a wondrous sound. Don't touch that dial. We shall return, and I'm hoping you will actually blow your minds. Wait for it. The other side of midnight.com. Tune in to listen to Richard C. Hogland and his fascinating guests. Support the broadcast and don't miss another groundbreaking conversation. Join Club 19.5 to get access to exclusive member benefits. Listen to past episodes anytime on any device. Search the archives of over 180 episodes. Membership costs $9.95 a month, 33 cents a day. Talk radio at the cutting edge of science and thought. The other side of midnight.com. Welcome back, everyone. Last half hour on this Saturday night, Sunday morning edition of The Other Side of the Night. And we have certainly gone to the other side of the mirror, because what we're proposing is that there was an ancient set of civilizations on Mars. And the last civilization, something like 40,000 years ago, when the planet ran out on them and the technology became too limited, too strange. They had to come here, leaving what was in Zero Crater for succeeding civilizations arising on Earth to go back and find and reconnect to. So, let me bring everybody back in, because I, I want to lay this really bizarre idea on you, and I want to give some kind of background to why it is not totally uh, kind of off the wall. Suppose that NASA has been, shall we say, doing their Emily Dickinson thing to the max, revealing bits and pieces of real data, but not providing the interstitial glue that anyone could kind of put together, back engineer what their real agenda was. I think the Perseverance mission from the get-go was designed with two stories. One, a cover story, looking for ancient microbes, caching samples to be picked up by a future return mission and brought back to Earth to be analyzed for the microbes, the biosignatures, you know, ancient evidence of ancient life on Mars. That's the mainstream story. I think the real story is the Perseverance was designed from the beginning to do ancient archaeology. That's why they landed in the middle of the ancient city. Just look at the look down images from MRO or from the descent itself, and you see again and again and again stunning geometric regularity to what's supposed to be a bunch of random rocks. We're supposed to be sitting on a lake bed, okay? We're supposed to be sitting on an ancient um, body of water with sediments that are hundreds of feet, maybe thousands of feet thick, where for billion years or more, the waters poured in from the obvious ancient riverbed to the, to the west, to the left on the images, and poured out in a hole in the crater rim on the right, depositing all kinds of stuff 
which is why you want to sample the stuff, because that's where marine organisms or microbes or maybe even more complex things might be found. At least that's the logic. But of course, if this was an ancient lake bed where a civilization held out the longest, where a dome provided a temperate atmosphere as the rest of the planet was going to hell in a handbasket, if this was the personification of the Lowellian Mars, then landing a rover with a radar system on it to look for microbes? Give me a break. It's looking for underground structures, buried buildings under the sands that have blown in from the umpteen million dust storms that have taken over Mars since the last inhabitants had to come here. Furthermore, they're also flying a helicopter. Now, we're told this is a technical demonstration. Let me tell you a little bit about space and spaceflight and the logic of NASA. From the get-go, the first golden rule of NASA, because things in space are very far apart from engineers, there's no spare parts, there's nobody who can make a house call and, you know, fix the drain or fix the blinds or fix anything. What you take with you is what you've got to work with when you land. So the rule of thumb has always been, since anything can break in space at any time, and the more complex the thing, and this is the most complex spacecraft ever sent to another planet, NASA says over and over again, it's what it is, it's incredibly complex. Don't you imagine that the engineers are staying awake at night, wondering, terrified, that something will break? So it, with that as a background, the idea of NASA from the get-go is do all your important stuff first before anything can break. I mean, this is really a, an incredibly hard and fast rule because, again, space is tough. The environment of Mars, it's 130 below at night. It's maybe 18 below during the daytime. The radiation field from cosmic rays, secondary scattering in the at Martian atmosphere, produces a much higher radiation environment on Mars than here. Computers don't like radiation. Instruments don't like radiation. So they're sensitive to being tripped and being mis- calculated and maybe winding up with a fault that can't be fixed by software or remote control. So the idea is do your important stuff first. So we're told that the helicopter, Ingenuity, is a technical demonstration for a mission that may not be sent from Earth for another 10 years. And the primary mission, the overwhelming mission of Percy is to look for life. Well. You know, it's kind of like, which is it? Is it looking for life? Or is it flying a toy that won't be useful for NASA for budgeting or for exploration or anything else for at least a decade, maybe longer? And yet, they're carving out 31 Mars days, called SOLs, to fly the helicopter. And they're doing it first. They're not doing any science. We're not doing any drilling, any core sampling, any close-up examination of the rocks or the soil or anything. They're just for the next month going to fly the damn helicopter. And in that month, anything could break. So what are they really doing? Oh, and in all the pronouncements, including the press conferences, they say again and again and again and again, we're doing no science with the helicopter. It's not meant to do science. It's a technical demonstration. It has no instruments on board. Well, actually, that's not exactly true, quoting that great line from uh, Independence Day. It's got two incredible cameras on board. It's four pounds, but it's got two cameras. One is a black and white, which is going to basically take pictures, and they're going to navigate the terrain based on uh, mapping of the terrain, kind of like the autonomous landing of perseverance itself. The other camera is an exquisite almost 5,000 line super HD color camera capable of taking frames and full motion video at more than 30 frames per second. And the idea is they're going to fly this thing in like five flights over a month 
land and then send the camera image data back to the rover by a, a radio link between the two. The rover then will uplink it to various satellites. There are three they're using as relays now. Uh, Mars, uh, Mars, uh, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, Trace Gas Explorer, and I think the Indian mission was the U.S. mission called MAVEN. So they're going to get the data back on Earth within a day or so of the flights. And they're putting out the time, planning it, setting aside all other things they're doing so that they can fly a helicopter that won't be of practical use for any NASA program for like a decade, for 10 years. Let me tell you what I think they're really doing. I think they're flying the helicopter as a reconnaissance for the real secret mission of Perseverance, which is to find architecture. They're looking for something. That's what the penetrating radar is about. That's what the helicopter is about. They're looking. They're going to do these flights in secret because, of course, they can censor anything they don't want us to see because it will not be transmitted back to Earth in real time. They're going to be flying again and again and again like sorties, like reconnaissance, which they are shying away from, pressed by the press who say, well, at the end of your five flights, why don't you go over here or go over there? Those are, And they will not commit to looking at anything interesting because they don't want the public or the politicians who funded this with our money to possibly think that the data from the helicopter, those incredible video images, are going to show anything interesting. What if they're looking for the cache? They talk a lot about caching supplies, samples for a future mission. What if you turn that around? What if you apply an Emily Dickinson twist? What if instead of caching samples, they're looking for a cache of the library, the records of when the human race left Mars for the last time? What if they're looking for evidence of successive civilizations in that 40,000 years on Earth, high-tech advanced civilizations, like maybe the guys that left the weird stuff at the South Pole, the Antarctic, and other strange things around the Earth? What if they're looking for those previous epochs of high-tech civilization who really built the pyramids, not aliens, but humans, because the curve of civilization goes up and down, up and down, up and down, mirroring the cyclic changes in the background physics of the solar system itself. And so they're looking not only for the old ones, the ancient ones, the Cosmic Engineers Library, they're looking for all the libraries and all the caches of all the more recent ancient civilizations that came after them up to the time they had to leave. Is that what they're really doing with the Perseverance mission? And is that why they prioritize a month to basically play with a toy on Mars? Gentlemen and ladies, the floor is open. Seems to work. Okay, we got a yes from Ron. Leslie? Yeah, they... Then we can all come I'm back. still pondering. <laughs> all right, Leslie's pondering. Still... The engineer in her is saying, there's got to be a hole somewhere. Got to be a hole somewhere. Ron, uh, uh, Andrew? Yeah. I think everything we've gone through, Richard, and the fact that it looks like we've got glass domes, so it's pretty recent. I think that's a good bet, what you're saying. Why have the radar unless you're looking for stuff under the sands? Yeah. I'll tell you why. Did you know they just uh, officially retired the InSight mission? No! Yeah, really? They said, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it had one job. You know, that scene you see in movies where somebody gets colorfully fired and they say, you had one job. Right. You know, it had one job, which was to drill a hole in the ground. And they can't. It won't do it. It just so they, it's so its ultimate goal of drilling a ten foot deep hole uh, with its fancy drill uh, complete failure. Can't get in the ground more than a few inches. But wait, wait, so wait. They, what about what about the seismometer, which was giving us all kinds of amazing data? What about that? They're just turning well, it all off. Right. No, I didn't. No, I don't think. I don't think they're killing. 
it, but they said that it's, uh, you know, they're kind of decommissioning it. Uh, what does that mean? So that I'm sure they'll... I don't know. Well, I, mean, I, sure I know what that means. Like readings for what those are. When, what? You, when you decommission a mission, you turn things off. The team walks away. There's no more money, no more funding. They've got a perfectly live spacecraft listening to seismic vibrations. I'm going to tell you what's really going on. You want my cut? Okay. They're hearing Absolutely. the wrong vibrations. And for this, I should, have, I should have the Beach Boys in the background. Remember good, good vibrations? <laughs> yeah. They're hearing, oh. they're hearing the collapse of structure, not Martian earthquakes, and they're turning off the pipeline so nobody else figures out the nature of the seismic sounds they're hearing through the ground, which I've been saying for months. Okay, so uh, my pondering has my pondering has yielded some results. Okay. <laughs> Besides yeah. um, the ground penetrating radar, well, radar might also. Uh, identify some things that are artificial but have been disguised and are not readily apparent. Okay. Uh, okay. Camouflage. Ruggiero? What's Ruggiero think? Um, I think it's uh, by the amount of evidence we've got. Um, it's quite compelling. There's both biological uh, evidence uh, we've presented and there's definitely the structural stuff, the architectural. Mm -hmm. Which, if you could go down to my items, um, you'll see if in image two and three. Uh, I was looking at that. Yeah, that's yeah. astounding. That's like a pipe. It looks like a, I mean, it looks like the outflow okay. pipe. Uh, that Everybody dumps... needs to refresh the page. Which I water on the beach. Yeah, I'm yeah. So, the page. so there's there's three piping sections. I've also I also sent you across Richard uh, a while ago on my sketch of the area. So I just want to categorically state that there is uh, two wheels uh, if you open up actually if you go into NASA's image one um, there is in I think approximately the uh, left third top you will you'll, you'll find a, a wheel image um, which is the same as the the one that I've uh, annotated in I've just lost my images excuse me in image three so there's actually two wheels on 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 that NASA Gigapen. Can I call it that? Is that right? The, yeah, the sure. sure. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I think I'm just going to go on to the image. The top top right hand section um, next to. Did you get in my thread feed the uh, the turret? I I can see the ones on number three. Yeah, there's two of them pointing to the left, right side by side. Yeah, I'm going to have to go through this image again. But on where the turret is, Richard, do you remember that? I remember. Said, yep. Um, there's a wheel right next to it. So I'm going to have to go away and draw these. But that's my my argument to this is that the architectural evidence is right there in front of us in the form of some kind of a destroyed um, tank type feature. Hmm. So, and these are ultimately from curiosity, right? It's, that, this is the curiosity image, yeah. 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 Huh. Cool. Anyone's thoughts on that? Mm. I mean, this, this this image here is, sorry, the, the, the NASA, let's call it a, a pan image, is absolutely littered with stuff that does look like broken pieces of machinery or architecture. Are we talking number two, Ruggiero, called tubing? Oh, we'll go back to the tubing, yeah. Let's discuss that because I'm going off tangent here. Uh, well, no, I, I, I just wanted to know which image we're looking at, three or two. Okay. I was actually referring to image one. It, it, oh, okay, it's got okay. Everything in there. I've just, I was just overlaying. One. We're, we're overlaying the, the, got it, the got it. feet. Okay. And around the middle of one is uh, where I took the, um, the feature that uh, shows the, the tank. Let's call it that. The, that's uh, probably got destroyed. Um, to the right hand side of it, we get image two, which is where we see the tubing. And uh, that's quite clearly coming out for anybody that's got the time. Can you see the big big hill outcrop? Oh, yeah. Uh, on the oh, yeah. Right mm. side, you follow it along and you actually find the tubing. There's three tubing pieces, sections coming out, the top, middle, and the bottom. And within uh, the middle tubing section, well, in fact, the the middle one and the lower one is a tube within a tube. Uh, 
us. Uh, nature doesn't produce that. Not that I know. We say that a lot of not here. Yeah. Well, it's true. Nature doesn't produce that, you know. So what we're doing, we're here breaking down the evidence, aren't we? We're, we're, we're not being wishy-washy. This is this is the fact, and it's on it's on the NASA imagery. So you know, I, I commend them for putting the image out there. But what is it? Well, see, uh, again, we say that all around here a lot too. Yeah. Uh, again, the strategy seems to be, and this is going to be another whole show we'll do on this. Very Masonic. Remember the Masonic creed. You don't get the answers till you ask the question, but you okay. can't ask NASA the question unless you have the data. So the way they've structured this, knowing human psychology, that no one's going to believe any of what we're saying tonight about any of this, they need an authority figure, a president, right. the head of NASA, you know, somebody at Harvard. They need authority figures to give them permission to think the unthinkable about everything we presented in the form of evidence. So they are putting everything out there knowing that the world will not react until there's an authority figure. Or, keep in mind, the Chinese are still in orbit tonight. What are the Chinese going to do? They teased us with a stolen image from Curiosity with their, you know, behind their, their, their rover and lander that they're going to reveal ruins. And they're mm. delaying until the end of May. Is NASA worried? Are the Chinese waiting because they want us to go first? Is there a behind the scenes agreement? Was the whole meeting in the Alaska? Alaska, wow, Kodiak, Alaska, with the Chinese yeah. and the State yeah. Department, all Kabuki theater to cover up the connection between Alaska, the Russians, the purchase of Alaska, native peoples in Alaska, where did those people come from? Are they related to the Chinese? Did they come? In other words, is this whole huge tangled ball of, of worms about to be unveiled on a calendar timetable that has nothing to do with putting out the raw data because they know nobody will believe anything we say until somebody in authority confirms it. Well, Richard, um, symbolically, if we think about Alaska and the land bridge that was there, it brought humanity along a bridge into a whole new world, or at least that's the prevailing thought, right? Yeah, and about 20,000 years ago, yeah, and if or 19,500. <laughs> but if we parallel that again with a, with a you know with a bridge from Mars to here, I don't know. Maybe that's just jumping way out too far. But that Kodiak thing is bugging me so much there's got to be something going on there. well it's an I island mean, all right yeah the simplest explanation is they named the butte you know the temple we're calling it uh, after an island because it used to be an island in this lake okay but as with everything nasa does there are levels of emily dickinson shining through we know and that's an extraordinary go ahead well, it was the Russian capital in Alaska as well. Like that was the capital city, the capital place. Oh so. my God, that's the connection. Because Yezero was the capital of the. I gotta compare this with the with the Barsoom oh. maps, Edgar Rice Burroughs. Oh, I haven't had mm. time to go look at those maps to see whether Burroughs knew the importance of Yezero, and he simply named it in his series something else. Richard, may I read you some, read everybody just a very short thing? It was um, it's my, it was the last image in my in my images. It was a, oh yeah yeah yeah. Let's, let, let, let's, let's, let's go back to John Carter, given that I just segued yeah. to Barsoom. I have a link, my second link, and people should go there. Um, I, I, it, it's called herbzine.com. E R B Z I N E. dot com. Now this is really cool. It's called the Seven Wonders of Barsoom series, the Hot House Cities of Okar, the third wonder of Barsoom. Anyways, these people, um, Bill and Sue on Hillman, I'll read it. First and only weekly online fanzine devoted to the life and works of Edgar Rice Burroughs since 1996. Over 15,000 web pages in archive. So, anyways, I found this one page, and let me read to you. So, the images of um, John Carter approaching this dome city in the northern climes of Mars. And here's their description. Edgar Rice Burroughs saved the best for last in his famous trilogy, A Princess of Mars, Gods of Mars, and Warlord of Mars. 
As Carter fights his way from the South Pole to the North Pole, as he tries to rescue his incomparable, incomparable princess Deja Thoris and stamp out the false religion of Isis, he encounters the North Pole's great ice barrier, the Carrion Caves, and the land of, of Okar. Okar is a gloomy, barren world of ice and crevices which lies between the pole and the great ice barrier. It is populated by yellow men with beards who live in hothouse cities which create a man-made paradise under their crystal glass domes. <laughs> <laughs> it is within these awesome. cities that the final drama of the trilogy is played out and where John Carter becomes the warlord of Mars. Hmm. Hmm. What did Burroughs know? And more important, how did he know it? See, if they're working off the mm -hmm. same ancient sacred texts, Burroughs somehow, Lowell somehow, NASA, JPL now somehow, what you'd want to do is go there to get real data because, you know, across 40,000 years, it's the old game of telephone tag. You know, you sit in a circle, you repeat something to the person next to you, they turn and repeat it to the next person and it goes around the circle. By the time it comes back to you, it's unrecognizable. What if NASA's mission is to basically go home and find the real story of our migration from there to here and the real history of Mars? And get this, it will be video. It will be incredibly high-tech records, not clay tablets or scrolls. It, Richard, it almost feels like they're, they, they either have a key or they're attempting to find a key or there's a door or there's a lock to the door that they've got a key that can fit in. There's just something that's saying X marks the spot. It feels well, like well, it. They're, they're, think of think of how you do this reconnaissance. And again, you know, we're outside, not inside. We're going to do this by ourselves in parallel to NASA. We're going to try to do the archaeology they're doing in secret. We're going to do it in public because they're providing masonically the data that we need to do the real mission. We just have to know what we're doing. Think of it this way. Leslie, you mentioned something earlier about using the radar to locate the, the thing that I think they're looking for, the library, the cache. What if the system is responsive like a transponder and the radar sends out a signal and the library answers because it's got a long lived power source, it's got electronic seal waiting to be activated, and when they ping it, it will ping back telling them exactly where it is. Certainly possible. Hey, Richard? Yes? You're getting close to the wrap, but uh, I just had a thought where Edgar Rice Burroughs might have actually gotten some insight. Uh, we looked before, and although he was contemporary with Lowell, uh, they never apparently met, but they did have at least one mutual friend, so they did communicate. But oh, uh, who, 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 who? I can't think of the oh. name right now. I Douglas was it Douglas. Somewhere. I don't know. Okay. But the important thing is that it was the same time frame when they were making those discoveries in the Grand Canyon that ended up down in the secret vault oh, of, my the, of, God. of the Smithsonian. Remember the Egyptian yeah, of course, of temples course. and the caves that you can't get to anymore? Which then and the all Smithsonian covered up, and the National Park Service will arrest you if you try to rappel down the cliffs and enter the caves that Powell, not Powell, forget the guy, he was rafting down the Colorado, and the Arizona newspaper in the 1916 mm -hmm. time frame published a series of stories about this incredible underground Grand Canyon archaeological discovery, which then vanished from history. Just vanished. Yeah. So that might have been, that might have been some of his inspiration, because remember John, uh, the John Carter story. What if they him. found archives in the Grand Canyon caves? There you We're go. A runway here. I see it. Uh, I knew that was happening. Okay. <laughs> Hey, folks, we are running out of runway. I want to thank everyone, all my guests tonight, too numerous to mention. So I'll say Ron and Leslie and, and uh, Keith and Kintia and Ruggiero and who am I missing? Andrew. Andrew. Okay, until tomorrow night, we're going to go deep under the ocean. 
and talk about strange biology there. Um, we are out of runway. Amazing. Hey, I want to thank everybody. It was an incredibly spirited discussion, leaving the door wide open to what we're going to do next week, because I'm going to really try to get one of these JPL engineers to come on the show, hopefully by next week, and talk about the helicopter flights on Mars. Because again, by everything we think we know, it shouldn't be possible, and yet it is. So until tomorrow night, same time, same bat channel, remember, third star on the left, straight on, till morning. Good night, everyone. Good evening, everyone, or good morning, or good afternoon, depending upon where you are on this rotating globe.